20,000 times each year, people from all walks of life come to the same place to settle disputes. Their disputes are over serious issues, from unpaid neighborhood dues and home repairs to protective orders and evictions. But they come to one place to get resolved, where every citizen can bring a legal action without having to hire a lawyer. It's Allen County's Small Claims Court, one of the busiest and most innovative courts of its kind anywhere. I'm John McGauley, and on this episode of In Session, we're talking about Small Claims Court, how it works, what litigants can accomplish there, and how to be ready when your day in court arrives. If you've ever been part of a small claims court case in Allen County, you will likely recognize my guest today. And if you haven't, they are without question the people to talk to about small claims court, how it works, what happens there, and every other aspect of this important part of Allen Superior Court. From the Allen Superior Court Small Claims Court, Magistrate Brian Cook, Magistrate Michael Douglas, and Magistrate Taylor Beatty. Your Honors, welcome to In Session. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. I love to kick off every episode of In Session with a round of introductions, so why don't we do that? Magistrate Cook is the most experienced part of Small Claims Court. Let's start with you. Um, I'm Brian Cook, and uh, as you said, if the most experienced, I've been my 25th year, and whether that's good or bad, um, I've sat on approximately, well, in excess now of 10,000 bench trials. Uh, before I took the bench, I was in a private practice in a small law firm and practiced in every area, civil, family, and a little bit of criminal. And before that, I clerked for Judge Sheldon in the Allen Superior Court was probably the impetus of what led me to the bench. Fantastic. Magistrate Douglas making your second appearance on our humble little podcast. You're next. And I'm glad to do it, John. <laughs> yeah, I'm Michael Douglas. I've been a small claims magistrate now for five years, believe it or not. And prior to that, I've, I've been an attorney for 17 years. Mm -hmm. I've been in private practice. I've worked for the Allen County Prosecuting Attorney's Office, Public Defender's Office, owned my own law, law firm for a period of time. And it's just great to be here. So thank you very much. Last but not least, Magistrate Beatty. I'm Taylor Beatty, and I've been on the bench for a little over three and a half years. Uh, before that, I was in a civil practice, and I was also a law clerk for Allen Superior Court for Judges uh, Levine and Avery. All right. So let's start with the basics. Uh, let's really at the foundation here. Talk to me about the philosophy behind small claims court. Why are cases like the ones you all see given their own venue versus taking place alongside every other case in the civil courts? The primary function of small claims is really set up for people to represent themselves. It's the, the informal resolution of their disputes, and in this case, obviously, civil disputes. Um, so people can come in, represent themselves on various cases, um, contract cases, um, auto accidents, whatever they may be for damages, and sue for damages in a, a normally a smaller amount um, under the jurisdictional limit of the small claims court. So it's really to get people into court without having to hire attorneys or go through a more formal process. And there's also a very specific limit on the damages that people can seek in small claims. Somebody tell me what that is and, and how that has evolved over the years. Currently, the limit is ten thousand uh, dollars. Originally, it was fifteen hundred. Then it moved to three thousand. Then six thousand. For a short period of time, it was eight thousand. And um, again, currently, it is ten thousand plus court costs. Generally, reflecting the truth that everything gets more expensive over time. <laughs> That's exactly right. Now, the cases that you all see here really do run the gamut. What kinds of cases do you see here most frequently? What sorts of disputes do people come here to resolve? That's a great question, John, and, and we handle a lot of things here in small claims court, one of which are evictions, uh, which leads into landlord-tenant damages. So, for example, if someone owes back due rent, um, any damages to property beyond normal wear and tear, say a hole in the wall, destroyed carpet, all those things. Uh, breach of contract cases, home improvement, it seems to be a, a more growing aspect of small claims. That's like where, say, I hire someone to come out and add on to my home and they mess it up from my perspective yeah. and I sue that that company or they sue me for not paying them the whole host of things along with uh, we do protective orders and any other civil case with the jurisdictional limit as magistrate Beatty just talked about of ten thousand dollars or less so if someone has some sort of issue legal issue that they believe and sometimes a non-legal issue that they still believe uh, they can file a small claims case and request uh, all the way up to $10,000 for a variety of those cases. Mm -hmm. 
and evictions and protective orders are certainly a, a large portion of what you all do, and we'll circle back and talk to that uh, in a little bit more detail as we go on. Now, on the other side of that coin, are there cases that litigants think they can file here in small claims that you don't handle? Yes. Um, we do not have equitable jurisdiction, meaning we can't enter injunctions, which are meaning ordered people to do something or to refrain from doing something. Um, probably the most obvious would be like when neighbors are suing each other over a property line to distinguish a property line and one neighbor wants the other one to move a fence or something. We do not handle those here. Um, the only area that we can do certain things on are order for possession of property, which is equitable relief, but it's specifically outlined in the statutes to give an eviction or, or return of personal property in a replevin action. So no equitable relief. Also, land contracts. Um, we used to handle those types of cases, but recently, within the last few years, there were some court of appeals cases that basically said it's not really the jurisdiction, proper jurisdiction for small claims to handle that. So in a land sale contract is if someone comes to a, a homeowner and says, I want to buy your property and I'm going to enter into a land contract and pay you a monthly mortgage payment towards that, uh, that's a land sale contract. And if there's any issues with that, a breach of that or anything like that, we used to handle those cases, but now we don't, and they go to the regular civil docket. Now, the number one goal of this episode, and really all the episodes that we do, is to give people kind of a, a primer on what you all do, Small Claims 101. So let's talk about the process. What can people expect when they walk in the door to file an action in Small Claims Court? Well, first they would come into the building. Uh, we are at 1 West Superior here in Fort Wayne. And they would go to most likely uh, check in, of course, that's very important, go through security, check in, and uh, most likely go to the clerk's office to get forms, ask general questions about the process. Any case that is filed, though, in our court would start with a notice of claim. So there would need to be a notice of claim filed for whatever action is being initiated. There would need to be service on the other party. Um, there would need to be a court date, whether that's a, a claims calendar, um, which is something um, that would be a bit more informal, a discussion between the parties, or a trial calendar date that is obtained. A trial would be something in front of us as magistrates. In mm -hmm. um, other words, a, a bench trial, I think we might discuss the yep. difference um, between a, a bench versus a jury trial later. And those would be the initial steps to get things going. At that point, um, everyone is served with their notice, and they would come in on the date, whether that's a claims uh, calendar date or a trial calendar date, and appear and have an opportunity to state their case. It's also worth noting, you, you mentioned the location on Superior Street, and it really is a, a one-stop shop. You know, People may be used to, if they've done other business with the courts, having to visit the clerk's office in our, in our beautiful courthouse, but there's also a clerk's office here, so it, it really is a one-stop shop, right? We are purposely set up. The small claims clerk's office is set up in the same building and always has been close or next door to the small claims court office. And so both of our staffs, we work hand in hand. As Magistrate Beatty said, you get the notice of claim form, fill it out, and then you take it to the court staff for a scheduling date and then can ask other procedural questions of the court staff. And then if something else has to be done with the clerk, like to take it back to get service on that, then you would go back to the clerk's office. And since they're literally 20 feet apart and on the same floor next to each other, it's easy to do that back mm -hmm. and forth and you can get it done very quickly. Thanks. And it was designed specifically for that reason to help individuals coming in that are not represented by counsel or an attorney be able to do these things relatively easy. Mm -hmm. And so we feel here in small claims that we've attempted to set the process up along with the clerk's office help to really make it as seamless as possible for the self-represented litigant to do what they want to do. And in a lot of things, not just that, but in a lot of things that you all have done in recent years, customer service really is the name of the game. Now, there are cases that get filed in small claims that, that might surprise people. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. Evictions are handled in your court. You all mentioned you all mentioned protective orders. Here's a new one I just heard, that if you don't pay your neighborhood association dues, you might very well wind up in small claims. Are there any other things that you all do here that might surprise people? The one that comes to mind is, is a replevin action, and that's just the legal term for return of personal property. 
we affectionately call them um, small claims divorce actions. <laughs> so people who live together have relationships but never got married, so they cannot file divorces and, and seek the, the recourse under the, the laws for marriage, come in here to divvy up what they accumulated together. Those are very difficult cases. They can get very emotional. They often involve pets. And so uh, oh. while pets are treated as personal property in the state of Indiana, we all know we're all emotionally attached to them. Mm-hmm. So there's a heightened uh, energy around the return of those pets and such. And then it is just strictly the rules of equity. You know, who paid for what and how are we going to divide this up? And if everybody paid a little bit and they commingled funds, we're going to try to split it as best we can, just like it would happen in a marriage case. And some people don't like that, but that's what's equitable. So it's one of those things, if you don't have a marriage contract or a written contract to the contrary, we're going to apply the rules of equity, even though we don't have equitable jurisdiction, um, but we can in Replevin cases. Now, another unique aspect of small claims is that you don't have to have a lawyer to file a case here. You don't have to have one to file a case anywhere in court, but this system is really set up for self-represented litigants. You do, however, have to follow a set of rules and guidelines. Talk about those resources that people should tap into before bringing a case to your court. We have small claims rules, uh, local rules that are available online. There's also a small claims manual that's available online. Those resources, uh, including our forms, uh, proper forms to be filed with the court, uh, can be located. So that would be the immediate filing a claim resource that we would encourage potential litigants to explore. Also, once a claim is filed on the back of the notice of claim or the second page of the notice of claim, there are some very important rules, um, a, a list that we've all looked over and edited Um, over the years to make sure the most important requirements of our court are listed. So again, that would be after coming in and obtaining that form to perhaps file a claim, that's a quick way to see some of our most important rules as well. Should people get familiar with those before they come in, or are there resources here that they can tap into to to get up to speed? It's ideal, and we would prefer for the, the litigant to have read and digested the rules and or the manuals before coming into court Um, because we do see a lot of litigants that come in and say "I, i don't know what i'm doing i don't know how to do this which is fine and we would direct them to hey there are rules small claims rules there's a manual to help but at the day of the trial it's a little too late so we would prefer people to look at those things and to piggyback what magistrate Beatty said you can go to in.gov and on the judicial branch tab Uh, also has the manual, small claims manual, um, as well as the small claims rules to look at as well. You can download those to review. We would prefer if you do that before court. Mm -hmm. You really should do it before even filing your notice of claim because what we also get is the day of trial. They'll appear in court and they may have filed an action that doesn't belong here as we had spoken about earlier. Um, Someone's trying to enforce a divorce decree. Um, My ex-wife has not paid her share of the insurance premiums or child support or paid for this or that. And we say, we don't have jurisdiction over that. You have to bring that in that case. And they say, well, why didn't anyone stop me? We cannot, my staff, the clerk staff, cannot stop someone at the door from filing a claim. It's their constitutional right, and we can't review their claim prior to them being in court with the other side being present. So that's their fault that they did that, and we cannot tell them until they get in here. So they really should look at what they can file and where in the appropriate court um, before they do that. The other thing I also advise is our courts and our trials are open to the public. If you have time, come down and view one. If you sit in the back of the courtroom and watch a case, you only only have to watch one and you'll figure out how we're going to proceed, what we're going to do. And we do explain the process from the bench before every hearing of what we're going to expect, how the evidence is going to be presented, how we're going to go back and forth, and even how you're going to get to your decision ultimately. To go along with that, John, to kind of put an emphasis on that the Indiana Supreme Court really wants people to look at these rules. And I'm just going to read here briefly from the rules. It says... Failure to comply with these rules or local rules of court, as Magistrate Beatty pointed out, sanctions may include assessment of cost or reasonable attorney's fees, the entry of a default judgment, the dismissal of a claim with or without prejudice, fines, and or incarceration. So the Supreme Court has has added that language in the rules, small claims rules, to just emphasize that, hey, please take a look at these. Yeah. Please follow these. So, and, and it's just a great resource anyways. And it's it's a good place to, to drop a reminder that we've made several times before. Your staff cannot offer legal advice. In some cases, they can offer technical assistance. And we'll, we'll mention some of that when we talk about protective orders and, and evictions. But the lawyers are the ones that you see on the bench. The, the staff can't do that. 
So this is probably a good place to give a shout out to two unique programs that we have here in Allen County that are unique to small claims and are meant to specifically help people with the small claims process. Give me your elevator speech about the Eviction Diversion Initiative and your Protection Order Specialist Program. The Eviction Diversion Initiative um, is really a grant-operated program. Judge DeGroote, um, and with your help, John, and, and the three of our help, um, wrote for a grant and received it from the National Center for State Courts um, to create a position um, to set up a program for landlords and tenants, um, and tenants to re receive rental assistance and enter a diversion program so that they can possibly keep their home, get rental assistance, pay the landlord, and everyone is happy then because that's what landlords are in business for is to rent homes or apartments and, and be paid for those, um, and then stay in the home, and then the eviction can go into a diversion program and ultimately be sealed so there's not an eviction on their civil record for the future. So we do have a staff member that handles those, and we now have initial status conferences. So the first hearing on an eviction case and a residential eviction case is a status conference where both parties come in, the diversion programs explained to them by our staff, the resources from just neighbors, Bright Point and, and legal services are all explained and those people are usually in the building on eviction days even and they give that information to the landlords and tenants to see if the, the parties want to enter into the diversion program and try to get it worked out and rent get paid so that the eviction doesn't happen. Um, it's working out well. I will say that not a lot initially enter into the diversion program, but many, many of them do get resolved without ending up in an eviction. Yeah. And even if there is an eviction, those resources, they're not court resources, but they're the outside agencies that we refer them to through the program, can help people find new housing, get other aid and benefits so that they don't become homeless during the eviction process. And that program is really just getting started. You're, you're not even a year in yet. Correct. The, the grant was a little over a year ago, but it took quite a while to get up and running, get yeah. everything going. The staff hired the, you know, our, our office even constructed for yeah. it and here in the building and then to really get going on it. And regarding the protective order specialist, um, we do have that individual. Her name's Rosie. She's fantastic. That particular position was created a little over five years ago by Judge DeGroote, and Rosie filled that spot immediately. So Rosie's job, in a nutshell, she handles every single protective order that walks through the door. Someone comes in, wants to file a protective order, they see Rosie. She can help them fill out the form. She can't give them legal advice, as we've mentioned before, but she can help them fill out the form properly. She can answer any questions about the form and any other questions that she can. And then she fills it out. She inputs it into the, the, the computer system. And then she sends it upstairs, because her office is on the main floor, she sends it upstairs to one of the three magistrates, and then we review the protective orders at that time. She's a very integral part of the protective order process. I mean, it wouldn't run without her as efficient as it does. And so she just does a great job. I can't say enough about that. And I will plug in session, John. It looks like episode four, what is a protective order? That's right. Um, so if your listeners want to go and check that out, um, I would encourage that. And what Rosie does in the process that you described really is essential to how quickly folks can get answers on protective orders. Correct. So they come in and she has time slots um, where someone can schedule an appointment and, and the time slots are 15 minutes. So that's relatively quick because the petition for a protective order is numerous pages. And so she helps them fill that out. She does it in a very timely fashion. We want to make sure, as you mentioned before, customer service. We want to make sure that someone's not coming in and spending half their day trying to fill out a piece of paper, even though it's very important. We want to make sure they get in, um, they have the, the proper information provided to them, they fill it out, they see a magistrate as quickly as possible. Um, and so Rosie helps facilitate that. And I think already we have 300, close to 300, if not a little more, new protective order filings just for the month of January. Wow. So we are a very busy court. Rosie's extremely busy. And I think the public, I think they understand that, frankly. Wow. Now, in, in my day job here in Allen Superior Court, I, I work in the administrative office and we field a lot of phone calls down there. A common source of problem for people that, that have been confronted with a small claims action is they didn't pay any attention when they got their notice in the mail. If someone sues you in small claims court, you need to pay attention as much as you would as if it happened anywhere else. Ignoring that notice of a claim doesn't make it go away, and it deprives the respondent of having their side heard by the court. Talk about what happens if you don't show up. 
We want everyone to have their day in court. We want everyone to have an opportunity to be heard, whether they are the plaintiff presenting their case and requesting relief um, or a defendant coming in and offering a defense or even coming in and, and filing a counterclaim. Unfortunately, we hear a fair amount of litigants who come in after they have unfortunately disregarded a mail that they received with a notice of claim, and they're filing for a motion to set aside a default judgment because the court can, at the request of the plaintiff, move forward with a default judgment, entering judgment against someone who ignores, essentially, a notice to appear on a court date. Now, again, there's a process that can follow up if a default judgment is entered against someone within one year. The court can, for good cause, set aside a default judgment. But that is obviously something that someone needs to come in and file a motion and then come in on that date as well and be heard on that motion before the court. Essentially, at that point, they're requesting that it be set aside to come in and have their bench trial um, set again. So all of that could be avoided, a lot of extra time, uh, not only for the litigant, but for the court and the staff if they would see what they get in the mail, uh, their notice of claim, and respond accordingly, and just come in. Um, Again, whether that's for uh, a claims hearing or whether that's for a trial in front of a magistrate, then they have an opportunity to be heard. And that's really what we want as well. And we all know that people are suspicious of mail and email that they don't recognize. If you get a notice from the court, it's the best idea is to open that up. Mm -hmm. And if you want to verify that it's legitimate, go to mycase.in.gov on the web, Mm -hmm. search by your name, search by the case number that you get in that notice of claim, and uh, it it will tell you right there whether Mm -hmm. it's, it's real or not. Also, on that note, John, I mean, if you don't have internet access for some reason, you don't have access to a computer right away, if you have access to a phone, you can call. You can call the small claims court, the receptionist, the judicial assistant. You can call the clerk's office. Mm -hmm. And all of these individuals, they really do want to help. And they will look up your case. They'll do anything they can do within reason to help answer those questions about when your court date is, what time is it, is there an actual case. They do that on on a daily basis. Is there a good central number for folks to call? Uh, 449-7157 is our general line here for small claims, and that gets us to a receptionist, and she, if she can't answer it, she certainly can direct you to the proper uh, location, whether it be within the court or within the clerk's office. Excellent. And I will tell you this, have as much information, as Magistrate Douglas said, of case number, name, who's suing you, and what, because we do get some litigants call down and say, I think I have a court date sometime <laughs> next week in some case. Can you tell me? And then my staff punches in their name, and there's 37 cases <laughs> spanning a decade, and nothing pops out that, that flashes red on our computer system that says hearing tomorrow in yeah. those. And our staff does not have time to start clicking through each of those cases, looking, um, scrolling through to see if there's a specific date on a specific time. So you need to be a little more specific of your request. And obviously, if you think something's fake and you've got something in your hand, you give all the information off that piece of paper, then we can confirm whether that is real or not. Another unique aspect of the small claim system is that there is never a jury involved, correct? Uh, Talk about bench trials and how those work and maybe even the typical time frame for how one of these cases would progress. When, as we've, the three of us have spoken earlier in this podcast on, is that you will be in front of one of us, and it's just one of us in the courtroom. And we actually have smaller courtrooms that are meant to hold six to eight people. We also have a large one that holds up to a 100. But uh, you come in, both sides have a table. And uh, once the notice of claims filed, I'll start with the time frame first, I guess. You're going to have a trial date that's set off between 40 and 65, 80 days. If you need more time, an hour or two, and, and sometimes litigants know they have several witnesses and or attorneys when they file cases, they're going to need more than the requisite half hour. We give you a half hour by default if you want to say that word. I shouldn't probably use that, but you get a half hour. If you need more time, you need to request more time, and that's in the trial rule, so you need to know that ahead of time. And then that, that hearing will be set off, like I said, 45, 60, 80 days out. And then when you appear at the hearing, we'll conduct the trial. And then we usually take it under advisement. We have 90 days to enter a ruling on it, and we'll review all the evidence. We'll issue a written ruling and send that to you in the mail. We try to get things out within 30 to 45 days, but there are some that are more complicated, or when we get in very busy times handling the 
thousands of cases, as we had said earlier, 20,000 new filings a year with an active caseload of a half a million. Sometimes we get very busy and we don't get to things in 30 days, so we will get them out, but we will always have it to you by 90 days um, to render a decision for you. Did you say an active caseload of a half a million? Yes, those are those are cases that are either seeking judgment on or have judgment. Wow. Most of them have a judgment in them, and they're just the people are trying to collect on that judgment. And that's the easy part is getting to the trial and getting a resolution, whether you get a judgment or you lose and don't get a judgment, then it's done. But once you receive a judgment, it is also your job to file the appropriate paperwork to collect that judgment. And that's a whole other process. Now, I'm sure that everybody who doesn't get the decision that they want to heads out of here and swears they're going to appeal. Can you appeal a small claims case? Yes, you can appeal a small claims case just as you would any other court case. A final judgment on the merits can be appealed. If I could, John, make a note. No one comes here because they want to see us for fun. <laughs> and Nobody comes here because they're having a great day. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and so we, when we ask someone before we get started how they are, we understand it's with that caveat, right? They're in yeah. here and they probably don't want to be. With that in mind, I think most of the feedback that we tend to receive when there's frustration with our decisions isn't always um, so much about the decision itself or on a personal level it happens to be with an issue of where the law is right and just so as a note I, I wanted to make sure I said that you know we take an oath to uphold the law as it's written um, not to do what we want quite frankly right and there are some cases because we have quite a variety of cases that come in that tug at all of our heartstrings yeah. right and we're people and we have sympathy obviously for everyone who is in front of us for a particular case but that means we still have to do our job and there's times that we have to make decisions that uh, maybe on a personal level we wouldn't want to make but we're following the law and so as, as a just a note I think that's a source of frustration and understandably so for someone who doesn't like the decision but it may be uh, the issue lies with the law as written and some frustration with that. Earlier, Magistrate Cook mentioned the active caseload of a half a million, and in any given year, you ha you get another 20,000 or so cases that get filed. There are three of you here to handle all these cases, so by necessity, you have to keep the pace brisk. How do you balance that need with the desire of everyone who appears here to be heard and, and your desire to, to hear them? Well, as, as it's been pointed out, John, each hearing is set for a half hour unless prior to the court date itself, the hearing date that it's been asked for additional time. So at a half hour hearing, and it's been our experience that that's sufficient time for both sides to really say and present what they want. I believe, and I think Magistrate Cook and Beatty also do, most self-represented litigants, they are prepared. They come in with their documents, their photos, and some don't have any, but that doesn't mean they're not prepared. They're ready to, to, to testify. And small claims is designed for fast and speedy justice. And so the rules of evidence, the rules of procedure, those things don't really apply. Now we've talked about small claims rules do apply, but it's designed for people to come in, present their case, and go. And that's really how we keep this system going is every half hour we're, we're moving through each case. Now, that doesn't mean that if once 30 minutes is up and you're in mid-sentence, we're not going to cut you off and say, okay, you're done, get out. We will let you finish. And if we can go over a little bit, we will. We try not to do that because that just maybe will creep into somebody else's yeah. hearing. So we do, we're very mindful of our calendar. But and we're very mindful of other people's time, frankly. We don't want someone waiting in the lobby for two hours, um, say their hearing's at 8.30 and they don't get in till 10.30 because the other cases are taking too long. Yeah. We are very sensitive to that. And so I think we do a very nice job of keeping things on track and, and on pace. Maybe on a personal note, let's let's talk about you know how you all wind up here. You, you don't run for this office, you get hired. You guys are hired and appointed by the four civil division judges of the Allen Superior Court. You have to want to be here. Magistrate Beatty said it earlier that people aren't here on their best days. Nobody comes here because they want to. They're, they're mad at somebody. They've got a dispute with somebody. They're often mad at you, often mad at the staff when they get here. What draws the three of you to this work? All three of you touch on that. I'll start with that, and, and year after year, and the entire time I've been admitted to practice, and even in law school, so we're going back to the early 90s on this, statistics, legal journals all show that about 70% of American citizens who appear in a court 
setting appear in a small claims type setting. Wow. Absent divorce cases, that's where you're at. If you're going to show up to court, you're going to be in a small claims type setting. I'm here to resolve disputes. So that's most of the citizens that are going to have some type of dispute. Like we said, home improvement contract case, an auto accident, a personal injury, all the things where it's not, it is big, it's important, but it's not millions of dollars. So it's someone that wants to handle it themselves. They're going to get a time to tell us their story, present their evidence to support that, and then we're going to give them a decision the best we can under Indiana law with what they presented. Mm -hmm. And I think we are very good at that. I think we have different personalities, but the one thing we do have in common is we all like to figure that problem out and get them the best result. But uh, I I enjoy figuring out that problem um, and resolving it and applying Indiana law to it. I believe we all three love the law. Um, That's why we became attorneys. That's why we became magistrates. And we love helping people. And when I say helping people from a judicial officer or magistrate perspective is I'm helping by resolving the dispute between the two parties. Mm -hmm. You might not like the decision, but you're going to walk out of the courtroom and know that you've had your day in court. You've had the due process. You've come into court. You've been heard. You've presented your evidence. And as a judicial officer, that's what I love about this job. I can help solve that problem. I can help resolve this issue. Again, it may not work in your favor all the time, but that is our judicial system um, that, that we all three uphold and, and have sworn an oath to do so. For me, it's, it's the core of helping individuals with that extra layer of using the law to do it. Magistrate baiting. There's so much frustration sometimes that litigants come into a courtroom with, and we can't solve all the problems in their life, but we all come at it from the perspective of believing in the rule of law, believing this is the best system in the world to resolve disputes, and wanting to help people on a level that we are able to do as a judicial officer. That's not solving all of the problems that they may have in their life that day, and we understand because we're all people. But with regard to what they bring into that courtroom, there's such a satisfaction in knowing that they are seen, they are heard, They have an opportunity to present what they need to on an even playing field and that they will get a similar result, right, from the three of us. We take great pride in that. Again, um, Magistrate Cook said we all have very different personalities, and that's okay, and I think that makes us stronger because we do bounce ideas off of each other, and that's a real asset, I believe, to the system we have here in small claims. You know, another tip that we might be able to offer people, a common question that we get in my office is, how do I collect on a judgment? How do I pay off a judgment? How do people accomplish that? I'll start with that one. Uh, To pay off a judgment, that's the easy part. Um, You pay the clerk of the court in the main courthouse at 715 South Calhoun. That's where they take money. They do not take money in the annex. And uh, you just have to have your name or your case number. And uh, it helps if you have multiple judgments to tell them who the plaintiff is or have your case number rather than just your name. Then it gets applied to the proper case. You can also contact the plaintiff. If they're represented by counsel, contact the attorney. If it's, a, if it's an individual, contact them to set up payment arrangements. You can't pay it in full, but you can make weekly or monthly payments. Try to work that out with them. Getting a judgment may be the easier part. Once you receive a judgment, collecting it could be harder. And as I had mentioned earlier, we have a half a million active cases. Most of those are in the judgment form. Some will get paid quickly, some will get pay, paid slowly, and some will never be paid because people are simply uncollectible or have disappeared. But what you are to file 10 days after the judgment's been rendered, if you have not heard from the defendant or had it paid, you file what's called a proceeding supplemental. Mm-hmm. And basically that's to set up a conference, a post-judgment conference, and the defendant's ordered to appear, or if it's telephonic, which we do have a face for that if an attorney represents the plaintiff, you will talk to the plaintiff's representative or come before one of our staff to talk to the staff and the plaintiff if they are represented by themselves or self-represented to discuss your income as the defendant, your assets, banking, bank accounts and stuff, and either try to set up a payment arrangement or the plaintiff has the right to garnish your wages, attach your bank account, and get the judgment collected. We'll call that the bonus tip. That's a good one. We, we do get people ask that question a lot. Well, this has been tremendous. In probably some cases, everything people are going to know about small claims will be what they hear in this podcast. So let's close with some final thoughts from all three of you. If you've got a chance to give potential litigants one more tip on how to navigate the small claims process, what would that be? John, you had had a question earlier, and we kind of touched on a few paces of what can you do. and And we've talked about reading the rules, reading the manual and stuff. Most important, 
show up on time and be prepared. People often, when they leave, they think, well, I didn't get to, they file a motion later on or a letter or whatever form they communicate with the court. I didn't get to say what I want. The, I didn't have these documents with me when I came that day. They weren't prepared. And so now they want to present their case after the fact or want a rehearing or something. And we don't do do-overs. If there's something egregious, then we may. If there's newly discovered evidence under the rules, we may. But most of the time, it's be prepared for your trial. Mm -hmm. Show up on time. Don't come at 10, Mm -hmm. 15 for your 10 o'clock hearing because you're already 15 minutes into your time and such. And uh, we aren't going to rush you, but you're going to need to present your case in a quicker fashion. And if you do that, as Magistrate Douglas said, you'll feel that you got your day in court and that you will get a fair decision. Um, Whether you like it or not, you'll get a fair decision uh, (laughs) Mm -hmm. based on the the facts and the law. Just as Magistrate Cook said, please come prepared on the date of your hearing. If there is something that you need us to know before the date of the hearing, please put it in writing in the form of a motion. You can get that from the clerk's office um, on the first floor and file it in the case so we can see it prior to the hearing. We want you to have your day in court. We want you to feel like you've been heard. So please come prepared. If you have anything that you can print out, pictures, any text messages, anything that you want us to make a part of the record, please bring that with you on the date of your hearing and be prepared to be concise and answer our questions and know that we will give you um, the amount of time that you have requested. Yeah, and to piggyback on on what's been said uh, by Magistrate Cook and Beatty um, about pictures and different things, in, in any Allen County courthouse, you cannot bring your cell phone in. That's We get a lot of people that want to come in the building and they have their cell phone in. Right, they have, in today's world, we have photos, we have text, we have snaps, we have tweets firmly, or now X's or whatever they're called these days, <laughs> um, on their phone, and they want to share that because it's important to their case that's a, a great tip is you can't bring your cell phone in but what you can do as magistrate Beatty pointed out you can print off pictures you can print off text you can print off anything uh, that you can put on paper format and bring that with you if you have audio or video you can transfer those things onto a usb drive uh, all the courtrooms now are equipped with televisions um, and we have a technology to be able to view those things in the courtrooms so we see those things often and that's where people get frustrated and feel they haven't had their day in court is when, well, I can't bring my cell phone in, so I can't give you all my information. It is their duty to make sure they know what the rules are. Mm -hmm. And we have these things posted, by the way, out front at the front door of the courthouse. Um, So it is posted for people to know. So that's another major tip that, that I think all three of us wanted to share as well. And since you mentioned that things are posted on the building, remind us one more time where you all are located. 1 West Superior Street, Fort Wayne, Indiana, 46802. Corner of Superior and Calhoun Streets. Caddy Corner from the Bud Meeks Justice Center, uh, right across the street from the Allen County Jail. I will say without any hesitation whatsoever that Allen Superior Court gets more phone calls and email asking questions about what you all do than about anything else that goes on in Superior Court. So I will not be the only one who really appreciates the three of you taking the time to be on the podcast today and help us walk through how all this works. From Allen Superior Court's Small Claims Court, Magistrate Brian Cook, Magistrate Michael Douglas, and Magistrate Taylor Beatty, thank you for being on In Session. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. This has been In Session, an inside look at the Allen County, Indiana courts. You can find out more on this topic and others at allensuperiorcourt.us. Thanks for listening. The next episode's coming right up.